So, dear friends of the Digital Classicist Seminar Berlin, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to our session today with Patrick Burns uh, from the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World of New York City University. And uh, we've already had a great workshop this afternoon, uh, some of us, and I'm very much looking forward now to your talk about how to read Latin like a computer, an example from noun chunking. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, uh, thank you in turn uh, and, uh, for the invitation and the baby in double bay and uh, the Berliner Antigua colleague uh, in general, I really do appreciate this opportunity to, to discuss what uh, is, has become I think an exciting new um, research direction for, for me. I've been training Latin language models for some time, but bringing together a connection between how this uh, computer side of what I do aligns with uh, philology in general, but also the teaching of Latin uh, is just a very exciting opportunity. So thank you for the invitation to discuss this. So today's talk is how to read Latin like a computer, hopefully a provocative uh, it, it, it makes you makes you think. And uh, an example from noun chunking. So we'll give a specific uh, uh, thing that we want to look at as we model the Latin language. And so um, I also, I'm, I can be found uh, at, at various places on the internet under DI, DIY classics. So, um, so in the uh, in the beginning of Quintilian's um, Institutiones, so his guide to rhetorical training, at the the very end of the proem, uh, pro, uh, the prologue, um, Quintilian writes that it is not enough for um, uh, a student to have natural talent uh, in in developing the skills of uh, of the speaker, but uh, in fact that it arises uh, from uh, having a, a, a skilled teacher, persistence in study, and multa et continua uh, exhortatione, uh, that it is in much continuous practice to use Russell's translation there, although for convenience sake, and as uh, the computational philologist in me, I'm going to conveniently translate this to, uh, uh, let's say, systematic training, continua exhortatione, on a lot of data. Okay, multa et continua exhortatione. So you just need a lot of practice. Uh, and it struck me that uh, this was a good entry point into this uh, conversation about what we're doing. We're, we're, we're trying to work, our, work with the Latin uh, at both at scale and uh, in a depth. Uh, but for the, as I said, we're gonna isolate a specific thing about Latin that we wanna talk about today. And that is like, we enter the conversation through this idea of noun chunking. And so, uh, before we can have a noun chunk, we have to know what a noun is. And so, I mean, I'm sorry to take you all the way back in your your uh, your your training here, but it's good to it's just good to establish terms here. So, a noun, a, you know, person, place, or thing, as we we imagine it. But here, uh, in this sentence, we can say exhortation is is a is a noun. So, what does it mean for us to then have a, a noun chunk? Well. First of all, it's not just uh, it's just not training uh, uh, in and of itself. It's a kind of training. It's a continuous training, and in fact, it is a, a lot of continuous, training, much continuous training. And we see how all these words are sort of working together in coordination. So we're not just dealing with a noun, but we're dealing with the whole idea of that noun as a concept. Uh, and we can even extend that of those uh, gen <clears throat> those genitives here are part of it as well. Much continuous practice. Uh, in writing, reading, and speaking. Now, what does it take for us as readers of Latin? And I realize not everyone in the audience is going to be a reader of Latin. So imagine in whatever language you're working on too, I put the English and the translation below, but as your, your German background, as I know many people working on different uh, historical languages here, what does it take for us to come up with the idea that not only do we have a, a noun, but do we have all the, like the constellation of words around that noun? And I'm going to call these the necessary decisions that we make uh, as readers. Uh, so we have to know where the words begin and end. In this example, that's a fairly trivial. Uh, we have white space between all the words that's separating them. Uh, but we have other tasks of a higher order. What kind of words do we have? And specifically, I'm thinking about, I have to say that one noun, uh, one word was a noun, whereas other words were something else. What are the qualities of that word? This is a, a word that is a noun in the ablative case. Uh, so it's a, a specific kind of noun that we're working with. And it's only we can coordinate which words are going with which because we know that information, multi and um, continua 
uh, also wound up being uh, ablative in agreement with that noun. How do the words relate to each other? So I mentioned the genitive case there before. So the words, some words are depending on other words, as we might say. So how do we figure that out? And where do the groups of related words begin and end? Why did I highlight uh, one section and stop? Uh, I didn't highlight per se, for example, in here. So which words go together and which ones, uh, where do we start, start and stop with that? I'm gonna call these the necessary decisions. And to arrive at, uh, uh, we, we, we process all of this as readers uh, extremely quickly uh, and it's sort of uh, the magic of reading in, in a certain way. Uh, and I'm thinking, um, uh, Mar Marianne Wolf's work on uh, how we read and the, this idea of a, of a cognitive blackboard. I'm specifically interested in this idea of our executive planning system uh, is directed towards a great many activities. So we do many things at once uh, in a coordinated fashion that amount to us being able to use semantic, grammatical, and other systems. Our memory comes into play at a certain point. But we work through these decisions uh, as readers we, can, we know which words go together because we've seen a lot of examples of this in the past and we're able to work with those in the present. And we would even be able to predict what they are in the future, uh, as we do in writing, for example. So again, we have the necessary decisions uh, of delimiting uh, uh, where things are in text and, and what they're like and how they go together. So one thing we might want to think about is this idea of constituency, that uh, we want to know that uh, when we deal with language, uh, we can talk about words, but we might also want to talk about groups of words that go together in such a way that they can behave as single units. And uh, this is going to be something we we're going to carry through this talk today. Uh, so, for example, uh, here I've highlighted uh, a morning flight. Uh, it's not just a flight. It's a morning flight, and English has a determiner system, so we know um, the, that it's not the morning flight or just morning flights in general, but it refers to something in existence. Now, we can do this computationally as well. And uh, I, this is going to be a code-free talk, with the exception of this one slide, I believe. Uh, but here's uh, some, some, a fairly minimal amount of code that using a trained Latin model can get us to the point where the computer can predict for us uh, what a noun phrase in Latin is. So, hang <clears throat> ignalum vitam, or the head of Medusa, caput medusae. Right? I've trained the model, and the model can predict which words are nouns, and then which words go with those nouns. So uh, I want to say, how, how, do, how do we start reading uh, Latin uh, like a computer, and what is the overlap between how we read and how the computer reads Latin? That's really the goal of today's talk. So first, on the computational side, the reason uh, I've been thinking about this a lot is I have been training language models, uh, 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 pipelines for working on these kind of tasks for the Latin language, and I, I, I released a model called Latency, an NLP pipeline for use um, with the, the, the Spacey platform last year. Um, and in working with the training of that model, it got me thinking about how I, how I knew how to read Latin at all. And so, first of all, I said an NLP pipeline, it'd be helpful for us to have a, a common working vocabulary. Having a working vocabulary in common is gonna be key to this talk generally, uh, but, uh, this is a composite definition of natural language processing taken from a number of different sources I like to use, but we just want to say, especially when we're dealing with historical languages, we're really talking with the written textual record, and, and for, our sake, uh, for, <clears throat> for our purposes here, we're going to be talking about the digitized record, right? what we have available for computers to work with, for this idea of manipulating, transforming, and otherwise understanding what's going on in that digitized text. Uh, that's going to be uh, what we think of as when the computer can do those things, that's the world of natural language processing that we're going to be in. And so uh, then what is Spacey? It is a specific platform, one of many that's available in this talk. Mutatis Mutandis could have been about any one of the other platforms, a stanza, the UD pipe, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I, I specifically trained the Spacey model, so we'll talk about this one. Uh, this is a, a, a you can go and download the code for Spacey, you can install my model, and you can do a number of different tasks like part of speech tagging or like dependency parsing, which we'll get to in a second, uh, et cetera, to get to the kind of decision where a computer can tell you where the noun phrase begins and ends. And Spacey is built uh, as a pipeline in which we feed uh, text, plain text into uh, the, uh, for, for the spatial, uh, <laughs> this is for the space of the slide, the left side of the model, 
Uh, we, we feed in plain text, uh, which is then tokenized, that is broken into uh, some sort of uh, sensible unit of analysis. I mean, basically words for, uh, for our intents and purposes today, that the tokenized words are then uh, put through um, a probabilistic tagger for uh, what part of speech it is likely to be, and a decision is made about that. A parser, which tells, again, how words are related in a sentence. We might even have an NER, uh, named entity recognition tagger, which will tell us whether or not something is a person or maybe a place or some other um, uh, concept, concept uh, of interest. And a pipeline can have many other, we see the ellipses there, uh, can have many uh, other uh, annotations that are added to that original input text such that we have a doc at the end, which is both the in input text plus all of its um, uh, annotations. Now, you may have noticed as I was talking about the pipeline, that in fact, I rehashed almost all of the necessary decisions that I talked about in the first part of the slide when we weren't using computers at all to read Latin, we were just reading. We, our mind was going through these, uh, this process of separating uh, the uh, sentence into words. Uh, that's tokenization or was trying to figure out what kind of words we have, part of speech tagging, or was doing the combination, the, some words were ablative and some words were singular, this kind of morphological tagging. We were doing that as humans, now we're having a computer do that for us. And then perhaps the most complicated relationship in this whole thing, dependency parsing, we're figuring out both how words are uh, relate to one another in a pairwise fashion, as, as it turns out with uh, dependency parsing, but also where those groups, um, it's kind of a one is a function of the other, where the groups uh, of related words begin and end. So this is uh, the, the model. You can go and download it if, if you're interested in working it with, with a, on your own in Latin uh, latency. Um, I, I won't talk so much about the, the specific model itself. We'll just use it as an example for how to get into this conversation. Uh, and also, I should say that the, the model performs reasonably well uh, as, as we would want to. I said they're necessary decisions. Uh, I didn't see any. I don't see any hundred percent of here, right? It's probabilistic. We're, we're getting towards a better and uh, higher accuracies on all uh, things. Uh, but it is nice to know that the tagging works at a reasonably high percentage, or that the morphology works at a reasonably high accuracy. This also can be done at scale, which uh, perhaps human reading. Uh, I, I can't sit down and read all ten, uh, all all of all the books of Quintilian, twelve books. Um, uh, but uh, I can run uh, um, a model over all the text of Quintilian uh, in, in a matter of seconds or perhaps minutes. Um, it would be great if the dependency parsing were a little higher for the tasks that we want to work, look at today. Uh, that's in fact a, a, a real goal of mine is to increase that um, accuracy over the next year. But again, to move forward in this work, uh, it's good enough for us to get started as we already saw examples from um, you know, Kappa Medusae, the head of Medusa, did, you know, there's, there's the, the dependency parser is working good enough to, to start this conversation. And what do these annotations that I discuss as the all, all the pipeline components uh, do their work? They do things, I apologize, it's a little small. They do things like give us lemma information, part, uh, part of speech information tag, and we can see them all. Here is it in a, in a nice grid format. Uh, and we can see what's working and what's not. Uh, I'll point out, it's nice to point out the errors first, right? Uh, so uh, poetis has been lemmatized as poetum. Uh, okay, so it's not it's not correct. Uh, it, it's not an unreasonable guess for, for uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sure as a beginning student myself, I once thought that the uh, lemma of poetis was poetum. Uh, we learn a lot, I think, from the kinds of errors the computer makes, a sort of a, maybe a, a, a subject for a different talk. Um, but uh, again, we're dealing with reasonably high accuracy that allows us to move forward in this conversation. All of this is based, I said, uh, it's, it's all probabilistic decision-making. It's, it's entirely based around uh, ideas of uh, machine learning, uh, which at its core, um, and here's a, a, a very nice illustration from Serpa's uh, blog post on neural networks. Uh, for a model training loop, and we want to start in that uh, like one o'clock uh, feed inputs. What we do is we take a lot of uh, correct uh, annotated data, uh, and we show that to the computer, and we allow it to then um, uh, figure out if it can uh, predict correctly um, uh, some aspects of, um, of that data that has been um, withheld from it, 
We collect those outputs. We figure out how right or wrong any of these decisions were. Uh, we figure out a way to then uh, re-weight uh, each of the decisions. In, in the original weighting, it's, it's, it's often just a random weighting. Uh, it, just, it just guesses blindly. But then you adjust it much the way you might um, um, uh, say, like, oh, I can now I can't think of these. Wow. Um, Oh, like, I don't know if you played this game uh, hot and cold as, as a baby child. You, you, you start with a random guess of, of how near or far something is, and then you, you just continue to make predictions to get closer and closer. That's uh, a kind of uh, uh, maybe a, an oversimplified version of what's happening here. Uh, and then it goes back, and it keeps doing this until you, you decide to end that training. It's it, it either stop it at a certain number of times around the circle, or, or maybe if it doesn't improve, you, you stop it itself. Anyway, we're trying to get better and better at each of these prediction tasks. Uh, and, th and this is very small. I apologize. I made it a little bit bigger here. Uh, this is the kind of data that we are using, that we're feeding into these models. This is a, uh, uh, it has, it has uh, it's called universal dependencies. These are con LU files that have the correct lemma, the correct part of speech tagging, the correct morphological information based on a certain number of sentences. This will show the model. Uh, and uh, we, on which we base its predictions. Um, and so I'll also say that uh, often what we're doing um, in these models is not using the words themselves, but we, we like to convert words to numbers in this world. And specifically, we like to convert words to numbers that have a certain meaning. And there are all sorts of ways in which we can get uh, uh, contextual information uh, based on computing um, uh, the say um, the, the the relationships between words, um, and in fact, uh, I use floret vectors in the latency uh, model, which is uh, not, not just um, uh, not not only are they contextual numerical representation, but they are contextual subwords. So we're not even dealing with whole words; we're dealing with parts of words to make that prediction uh, process um, as as good as possible. And so we see that, uh, for example, this is taken from the um, the blog post that Spacey has on floor vectors. We're not just looking at, say, the word apple in an English use case, but we're looking at the parts of the word apple. Well, uh, parts of words can be used useful uh, for predicting certain uh, parts of speech or, or different uh, other annotations. So we, we are talking about constituency, uh, and that is specifically treating uh, the idea of that certain words can be treated as a single unit together. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the universal dependencies use a different arrangement of, of words, really a pairwise uh, relationship. Every word is going to have some uh, way in which it depends on other words. And so instead of uh, on, the, on the right side, we have uh, a, a morning flight through Denver. We'll see uh, in the dependency set, uh, the relates to flight, morning relates to flight, Denver relates to flight, and through uh, goes to Denver. So we, we get these one at a time uh, bin directed binary grammatical relationships between words, as Jurafsky and Martin give us. Uh, so this is going to be, we're not going to be quite dealing with constituency, although I think constituency is still a useful idea for us to think about in the terms of uh, we want to deal with groups of words. Again, thinking we want to talk in this uh, today about noun chunks. Not um, not just individual words, and so um, it, it, this is um, it, it's important to have some understanding of dependency parsing. This is only a uh, forty minute talk, and I don't have so much time to get into it. Uh, but uh, I do want you to start thinking about the idea of uh, of, of one way in which we can approach um, uh, a parsing, uh, and it's the idea of the stack in the oracle. Uh, that we're going to move left to right across a sentence and uh, put um, words, say, one at a time on the stack and then use an oracle. It's a very nice uh, classical I, I know, word to use here, uh, although the oracle does not always give us uh, such good information. Uh, but we want to add words to a stack and then ask uh, the oracle again based on uh, a number of either rules-based or, or maybe, uh, in this case, for Spacey, um, a machine learning process, uh, is it likely that these two words go together? And if they do, it will make the annotation. And if they do not, perhaps it uh, will uh, take the word off the stack and go to the next word and continue through that process until it has made uh, a, a, a good estimation of all of the relationships uh, that are likely to exist. Um, 
so some some words are going to um, we call them left arc and right arc, uh, just depending on the, the direction with which word might depend or be depended on by others. Um, we also this is we, we need to use this process to find the root, the main verb off of which all of the other words hang. But again, this idea of moving left to right and making decisions is something I want you to keep uh, in a placeholder in your mind. And so um, we can then uh, visualize, I showed you one uh, kind of visualization of a dependency parse, so kind of that upside down tree, uh, but spacey through the, this is the displacey um, um, uh, visualization can show you uh, uh, all of the words in the sentence, again, left to right, and uses this kind of like uh, these arrow um, uh, these arrow arcs to to show you how the relationships come together and from even just like that's again kind of distance we can get a look at a, a specific part of the uh, the visualization we start to get a sense of which words uh, group together and how they relate to each other uh, in a visual form. So uh, that's more or less how uh, the computer reads Latin. That was, uh, you know, clearly a simplified version of it. There's a lot more going on, uh, but it gives us a sense of the kinds of things that a decision uh, that a computer is keeping in mind as it makes a decision, and it, it, the the uh, uh, keeping in mind the the uh, how easy it is to go to the anthropomorphic very very quickly with computing uh, is, um, is, oh, is 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 something I'm aware of. Uh, as I literally move towards um, the, uh, again, the human reading of Latin, let's return to that. So how do we read Latin? And so as I was training this model uh, last year, I was coincidentally reading some of the pedagogical literature on best practices for uh, teaching students to read Latin. And uh, I was continuously impressed as I read that um, the, the worlds uh, were closer together often, uh, more often than I would have expected. Uh, and so, Kind of at the heart of today's talk, I want to have this comparative. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of best practices from the pedagogical literature, uh, so we can start to see both, both the, the similarities and I guess differences between uh, computational reading and human reading of Latin. But here's where uh, you, I'm just going to give you a sense of where I'm headed in all of this is that I feel that by creating a space by which we can compare and contrast uh, computational and uh, philological or pedagogical reading of Latin, that uh, we're, we're, I'm moving towards being able to better explain how these things are working uh, for the benefit of the human reader uh, in collaboration with the computer and vice versa. I'm a, I can train the model better if I have better philological, pedagogical grounding. And the three, uh, pedagogical works I'll be drawing on from today um, in uh, somewhat quick and rapid succession will be this idea of disambiguation uh, uh, based on uh, um, Daniel McCaffrey's work on um, these words that uh, create effects in text, or uh, Waldo Sweet's idea of metaphrasing, and then Dexter Hoyos's idea of word groupings via arches. Okay. So let's turn first to... Uh, <laughs> McCaffrey, excuse me. Um, in uh, in his um, uh, uh, article, when, when reading Latin read as the Romans did, he starts talking about how we have this set of strategies that we work with as readers uh, of the language, um, by which when we're moving left to right, we can we we know that we're going to encounter encounter these moments in which we don't know quite what to choose for what kind of word something is or how a word relates to each other, but there if we see enough Latin and we develop the system of rules based on so we infer some patterns from the Latin, when such and such circumstances exist, we can then consider that target word to be so and so. And he talks about the, these um, strategies, disambiguation strategies, which largely come down to different types of agreement uh, or, uh, in, in, or, or completion. Some word requires another word to come up and complete it. And what strikes me here is that, as he says uh, in a different chapter, <clears throat> different chapter, uh, that Latin teachers have these strategies at hand that they probably learn them by informal means by example or by trial and error. And I wanted to impress upon you that this is literally how the machine learning 
uh, loop works, right? By example, we, we provide the computer with maybe, I was gonna say hundreds, thousands uh, of examples of uh, any, any grammatical phenomenon in context. And we allow the machine to infer certain patterns this is what we do as human readers as well. And then it is only by trial and error, having seen um, a, a, an example enough times and either having guessed it wrong and then figuring out eventually what the right decision was or getting it right and moving confidently through the sentence that we arrive at decisions that start to make sense. And so um, we already have with these disambiguation strategies that again, that set of strategies, right? Uh, uh, heuristics that come into play to help us infer patterns in the language and build up uh, a, a, an ability to decide at any given point in time as a reader what is going on. And I think that is uh, a, an analogically similar to what's going on in machine learning. For Waldo Sweet, and I have to say, through McCaffrey's work, metaphrasing uh, and Sweet's work is, is, is also very important, but let's uh, see how Sweet was uh, thinking about how we read Latin sentences. Uh, from his uh, textbook, uh, Latin Structural Approach, from uh, the, the University of Michigan style of teaching Latin in the uh, mid-20th century, uh, <clears throat> metaphrasing is a technique of showing both lexical and structural meaning of, a, of each term as it occurs. So we move left to right through sentences, and then we're constantly in a decision-making mode in which, again, think about the parser, the stack and the oracle, where we're making decisions or suspending some amount of the decision until we can come up with a decision. And so it may not be pairwise. We may have a more complicated relationship between different parts uh, of, of the sentence as it unfolds. But Sweet is encouraging you to read left to right and create positions for what's going on. You see the word in in the first part of the sentence. It doesn't matter um, where that prepositional, you know, one, you know it's a prepositional phrase because you can identify in as a, a, a your internal POS tagger has gone off successfully. You can likely predict that the next word is going to be a noun or an adjective because you've inferred enough patterns from the Latin. In fact, that is what we get next. We get an adjective in the ablative case. Um, but in the first instance, you just create a placeholder. You know it's on the stack somewhere, and you're going to start putting the words together. In pulpra, we know those two can depend on each other in a certain way, right? Because we know that in uh, can take uh, as its complement a uh, an adjective or a noun. It's, it's eventually looking for a noun, possibly could be substantive. Uh, but we can create, we know those are going to be, we look at the, the, the plane example from earlier, those are going to be hanging off of each other in some way, day, pen. Uh, in, in the etymological uh, fashioning of that word. And so in Polkara Weste, and you see, as the sentence continues to unfold left and right, we are, we are uh, putting it on the stack, and we are, we are the oracle. We're the human reading oracle that's making the decisions about which words can go reasonably together, uh, and, and so on. I don't need to take you through the whole sentence, but eventually you're going to make your way through the entire sentence, and you will every word will have been on the stack, and you're a human oracle will have made the decision about which words depend on which words, hopefully successfully. But much like the uh, computer, uh, the machine learning example, we learn, uh, as McCaffrey said, through example and also through trial and error. We just get better uh, having seen more data. One thing that I think is really interesting, uh, the suite is not literally making use of decision trees, uh, but in a sense, there is something uh, decision tree-like uh, about moving left to right across. I mean, at each word, uh, we're getting um, uh, branches of what could possibly be, and then either uh, keeping those uh, branches open or closing them off. And so uh, I, I showed this figure from uh, Helmut Schmidt's probabilistic part of speech tagging using decision tree paper, uh, which is the tree tagger, um, uh, um, um, uh, tagger, <laughs> the tree tagger, a uh, part of speech tagger is, is based on. So we know that this is a successful route to probabilistic decision making in uh, Latin or any language, NLP. And again, think about the stack and the oracle. We're moving through the text, making decisions uh, and, um, and moving uh, closer and closer to having all words accounted for in uh, the original sentence. Now, uh, this is a, a bit of an aside. I don't have enough time to talk about this, but I did find this amazing sentence in, um, in when I was rereading a sweet book in preparation for this talk. I do think it's relevant for the talk too, though. A word has different meanings according to the different environments in which it occurs. 
Your job, besides learning the structure, is to learn the different meanings as uh, the various environments appear. And so on the one hand, uh, this should be now quite reasonable for you all as you listen to this talk. Uh, it, meanings here is referring to what a part of speech tag could be or what its dependency within a sentence could be. That's all very good. But um, Sweets, the textbook comes out in 1957. You may go to other talks on this general topic in which um, we start talking about the distributional hypothesis and about uh, vector uh, semantics and, and um, John Firth will come up with, uh, you will know a word by the company it keeps, uh, like a really like core, that is, I mean, sweet is I, I clearly in that, there's something alive in the air of linguistics and language learning in the late fifties that is bringing us to this kind of thing. Uh, and I just think it's kind of nice that and it, it is literally, I mean, if we were to put this through vector uh, similarity, we might, these two, two sentences might be very similar, so. Um, I just wanted to put that up there. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to come to is, again, uh, from Dexter Hoyos on this idea of how we group words as readers. Uh, and uh, specifically, I think this is where this whole talk really originally came from. I, I remind you of those that uh, Displacy diagram I saw. You're going to see it again, so don't worry about it. Um, first of all, <laughs> this is a great, great, great quote uh, from Hoyos. Individual words by themselves, like individual chariot wheels, have limited use in communication. So very much Hoyos understood that the only way we're going to move successfully through any Latin text, whether it's a sentence, a, a phrase, a group of sentences, is left to right by group, grouping words together in ways that are meaningful and continue uh, to mean things as they unfold over time. And he talked about how in order to read Latin correctly, we need to, uh, we need to grasp the pattern as the words are read. Um, and so this takes practice, and I, I can't help but think of the exhortatione from the first slide. Uh, but it's completely achievable. Uh, and this is, um, uh, as you work through Hoyos's book, uh, he, he starts giving you these ways in which you can get better at figuring out um, the ways in which the words must go together to create sensible units. Uh, and uh, again, Hoyos is really dealing here with constituency, right? Like we read because these make sense, and, or, or maybe it makes sense because we read this way. In fact, those two things are very much complementary. Uh, and uh, I, again, it, it, I, I know they're not exactly the same, but the visual similarity of like thinking about um, words as as grouped together and delimited into into certain patterns uh, is just is just too attractive for, uh, for for me to pass up. And so I think in very many ways this is where the the, the whole talk began with this idea of uh, the ways in which we visualize dependency have an arch like quality based on Hoyos. And so um, it is with that that I'd like to put the two or maybe three parts of the paper together, not just how do computers read Latin and not just how um, uh, humans read Latin, but what's the collaborative process between the human and the computer? How do we read computer? How do we, how do we read computer? How do we read Latin like a computer and, like, uh, and how do the two inform each other? Well, um, I, I, I really quite like this uh, quotation. I usually use this in the context of doing literary criticism, for Latin, but John Biagio Conti starts, he talks about the literary condition, uh, and uh, he talks about how we have these, uh, we have these um, poetic devices that as a reader, we, we, we pick up, uh, but in fact, what it is, is a series of phenomena that could only, that, <clears throat> that could otherwise be registered only piecemeal in uncorded, discrete details, and to me, this really gets to the point of what's going on uh, and why we have a collaborative process in the best case scenario with the computer and the human is that as we read text as a human, we will, as Hoyo says, uh, pick up those groupings. We do, as McCaffrey says, uh, figure out which words uh, tend to disambiguate from others. Um, at, at least we do when we're successful as readers, but we don't necessarily keep good track of all that information such that if you were to read, uh, if, you, if you were to sit down right now and read, all of Quintilian. Okay, that made that, that uh, if we were to sit down and read a page of Quintilian, and then I were to say to any one of you, "Can you let me know how many ablatives you saw?" You you would have trouble answering that question, but you would know I saw some ablatives, right? Or um, maybe you you read through a section. Uh, this often happens with with uh, poetic devices, like Conti says. Like you you read it and you realize there's something. Like maybe a lot of Sibilins, you, you, you intuit from, uh, from a poetic text that there's a lot of S sounds. But if I were to ask you how many S sounds, you wouldn't necessarily be able to answer that easily. 
but the computer is very good at recording and recording complexity and recording complexity at scale. And so being able to combine the piecemeal with the general, I think is a really great way of thinking about how we move from um, reading to uh, computer reading. And then I think the best uh, uh, explanation that I've read recently about how we model that as, as readers, uh, not as computational readers, as readers, uh, is from um, uh, Chris Forstall and Walter Shire's book, Quant Quantitative Intertextuality, in which they talk about, and they use music as a metaphor. When we listen to music, we're constantly predicting what note might come next, or we, we kind of understand the larger frame of genetic, like what genre we're in or something like that. As readers too, we're constantly building up a model, whether it's, here's an internal model of that culture, but there's all sorts of signals we take in uh, as readers. We create a model that as we read left to right or top to bottom or throughout a book, um, and we're constantly updating our expectations based on that internal model. Again, we're, 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 we're reading and we're constantly giving ourselves more data by which to infer patterns and to make predictions and to create a model of what we're doing. Again, humans are good at this, but maybe it doesn't always work uh, at scale and maybe it doesn't always work at, at speed. And again, at that nuance of being able to record each decision. So if I have two takeaways that I want you to uh, get from this talk in, in which I've compared um, the, the human reading of Latin, but it could have been any of the languages you work on uh, in a certain respect, um, and, and how computers uh, can, can read the language. Um, these are my goals in beginning this project. Uh, one, I wanna create a shared vocabulary around reading um, in both senses for philologists and teachers and for NLP practitioners. And I think that by uh, having a comparative and contrastive approach to the, the best practices for both that share some, even if it's uh, the simple word read, like that's a moment in which each becomes uh, uh, an entry point for the other to understand. And then I'm doing a lot of this work, I think, in, in, in the interest of moving towards uh, explainability and interpretability, interpretability in computational philology. There's a, a great deal of discussion about explainability and interpretability in, say, machine learning contexts, uh, trying to avoid a black box thinking uh, in, in model training. Uh, but um, in fact, there's a certain amount of, of um, uh, uh, that, that um, obscurity that um, when, when I have conversations um, with uh, interested uh, uh, people in, in the field who are either teaching Latin or, or come from a traditional philological background, creating that, um, that way in which I can discuss the computational models in philological terms or in pedagogical terms. Again, if, and if I can draw from the literature uh, and, and, and so we're meeting each other in, in the middle on these things, I think we'll go a long way towards both adoption uh, of, of models that exist improvement of the model that exists. I want teachers in the loop. I want philologists in the loop making things better. Uh, and then also figuring out um, um, maybe what um, our, um, our next step should be, what other things need to be developed uh, and, and place our energies in, in good places. Again, uh, human uh, machine collaboration being at the core of all of this. But now the unexpected complication um, and so uh, I think in all talks like this, there's going to be the eventual, maybe, maybe you even have a predictive model of what's going to be on the next slide. Uh, so we also now are in a world where some amount of that, again, obscurity uh, is made uh, um, attractively available. I, I, what, is, uh, what, what happens to my talk up to this point when we start talking about large language models? Uh, are, or ChatGPT, I, I can, again, uh, ChatGPT was not trained to do noun chunk parsing of Latin. I can guarantee you that, that has never came up in any of the discussions in open AI. Like, oh, you know what we should do is we should make better noun chunkers for Latin. That didn't happen. But if I feed in the sentences that I showed you from my earlier model, I get, I, I, it, it, okay, it didn't say hung ignalum mitam, but it did get caput medusae, uh, and this was with zero prompting uh, and, and zero additional prompting. So uh, I do think that uh, in, in creating this, again, interpretable, explainable philology, uh, pedagogy, 
for Latin or it could be any, any language. Um, this is a complication that I, we, we <laughs> I need to reckon with, uh, but we can do it together. Uh, and so I, I think it's important that we at least recognize uh, that this is, uh, this is where we are. And I, I've talked uh, quite a bit in this last part about human uh, machine collaboration. And I'd like to come back to that opening quote, multa et continua exhortatione, again, what I said was systematic training uh, on a lot of data, right? That's how I'm, if, if I had a load coming out uh, this month, that's, no, I would, I would still use uh, much continuous practice. But uh, this is only one part of uh, the recommendation that Quintilian has, right? Uh, that, that training is part of it, but I actually wanna take it to the uh, Dr. Perito, Dr. Perito, right? that this is only going to happen with multiple things in coordination, right? So we need to have not just the training of models to do that pedagogical work for us, that philological work for us, but we need teachers, we need the philologists also working with us to get that collaborative uh, emphasis. And I'm not gonna leave out studio uh, Kurtanaki either. Uh, we do wanna have persistence in study, but again, skilled teacher, continuous training, that's where we are. And so with that, I would like to conclude the talk, uh, how to read Latin like a computer. Hopefully you learned a little bit about noun chunking, uh, but even more, I hope you learned something about why we train Latin language models and how they can be useful uh, in the field with uh, the two sides coming together in coordination. Thank you.